Uh, some of you are in other countries uh, scattered around and some of you are there in Norway. I see Denmark is there too and uh, to our to our Light Channel team there and others other names that I don't recognize. Uh, uh, at, at the request at the request of uh, of uh, Sister Eva, we're we're uh, wanting to address some of the issues. Uh, first of all, I, um, uh, let me say that I'm assuming everybody's hearing okay. Uh, evidently, uh, Sister Eva would not have would not have exited unless unless they could hear me. So um, I guess uh, I need to be reading. Yeah, we can hear you there. Okay, very good. Thank you for the confirmation. Uh, the I want to say first of all, my wife and I have been praying a very large, uh, large amount uh, regarding this before presenting this subject matter. Uh, and even after presenting, we've had, we have great peace and joy uh, up to this point. Many people send encouragements, but um, we have not been discouraged. Uh, I don't think we've even been tempted to be discouraged because we have God's great peace filling our hearts that this is a subject matter that God's people need to be talking about. And God's greatest concern was sleeping during the last final moments uh, when we should be preparing. So being awake, uh, be studying, and praying together, and, uh, and, and reading as much as we can, and, and hearing the presentations, and digging uh, into uh, this material is exactly what God is wanting his people to do right now because being awake is uh being awake is is the only way that we can uh that God can send move us in the right direction if we're sleeping we sleep right through the last final events we we might wake up with no oil in our lamps without having done the preparation so necessary to be able to enter into the wedding and before the door is closed so uh, so we want to say, first of all, that in all this, these last three weeks, we've had God's great, great peace and joy in, at all time, uh, at all moments. Uh, and so we're, we're encouraged, we're, we're blessed to be part of God's work and the wake-up call. Uh, we, don't, we don't expect that we know everything. We, there's thing, I think there's much, uh, like Sister White said, much to learn and much, much to unlearn. So we believe that uh, everybody who's been studying has something that they can add to our understanding and to our knowledge, and we ourselves have greater information to to uh, to understand and to study. And as events begin to unfold, we will understand even more. We do have a, a firm conviction that um, we do have a firm conviction that. Uh, we are to understand what is happening, and that God never did, Amos three seven that the Lord uh, God would not do anything without first revealing it to His servants, the prophets. But but uh, if we study the prophets and we're awake and studying and praying, God will certainly not catch us by surprise. He has never He has never brought final judgment to anybody, uh, be them be it pagans or His own people without first sending a warning. So we can expect God to be the most interested party in, uh, in be the most interested person in, in preparing us for what is about to happen. Not as a surprise, but to be awake and studying. Now, uh, first of all, a, a, couple, uh, a couple weeks ago, Doug Batchelor called me. We're good friends. Like he said, we are good friends. And uh, he and I are planning to to fly down to South America one of these days together. And uh, uh, and so he called me and he said he was concerned. He was concerned about the fact that maybe I would be out on the limb, uh, maybe uh, having a different, a different um, uh, explanation or of what's happening than the, than the majority, than the group does, than the, uh, the most common understanding, and he was afraid that I would be left out by myself uh, on an iceberg uh, by myself, and it would affect the ministry. Well, I really appreciate him calling me on that because the good friends do that. Good friends would contact 
uh, a friend and uh, and explain. Uh, I really thanked them for that. I appreciated it, but I told them I've been out on the iceberg by myself so many times. Uh, I've had um, that when we bought the television network in Bolivia, uh, we signed a 1.5 million dollar purchase agreement, and almost all of the almost all of the who's who in the Adventist Church turned their back on me, uh, especially those with money, uh, ASI. Uh, 3ABN, uh, the wealthy Adventists, uh, at least I have four wealthy Adventist friends, and they all turned their back on me and said that was presumption, and that uh, signing a large contract for a television network was presumption, and therefore they wanted nothing to do with it. And so I was left by myself for 18 months, and uh, it was very painful, but, but we had God's peace, and we had God's certainty in his promises. So we kept going forward. And as you, many of you know, uh, uh, the day before we had to pay, uh, I received a phone call from an elderly physician whose wife had died, and uh, he, he asked me how much I needed. He said the Lord told him to call me, and I told him $1.5 million, and, and he sent $1.5 million. So we were able to pay the next day the money, and of course the world was in shock because they said if it's presumption, why did God pay it? And it wasn't from the wealthy group that controlled the, the, the money in the church. Uh, it was from somebody who they did not expect. And, uh, and so uh, suddenly the being out on an iceberg by yourself turned out to be a very high visibility, high credibility event. Another time we've been out on an iceberg by ourselves was when the general conference uh, president uh, told me that he no longer could defend me because I had too many enemies and that he would focus on 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 administration and let one of the vice presidents deal with our case. And uh, I was sad to hear that because Pastor Ted Wilson and I had been friends for 24 years, but he felt I was, uh, I was, I was too hot and had too many enemies. He could not afford more enemies. He had enemies too, he said. So, so I lost I lost the support of a good friend there, but he assigned me a vice president that turned out to be not a friend, but uh, uh, the enforcer. And so uh, we, were, we were requested at a meeting with my wife and I, requested to shut down our ministry between five and ten years, uh, all the airplanes, all the orphanages, um, uh, all the television networks. And, and uh, our board was, well, I have four ordained ministers on our board. And uh, we talked together, and unanimously they said nobody has ever been asked to do that before. So, so um, uh, they unanimously decided that we could not shut down. And I wrote a nice letter to the general conference uh, addressing the three points they asked me to. Uh, and, um, and they've accepted two of the points, but the third point in which I'm, uh, I, I basically have to agree to be uh, only work with when when I ask permission, uh, and not work unless I ask permission and and, and get permission. Uh, that part uh, we could not agree to, because God has to call the shots in our ministry, and He has the final word, not 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 a committee. Uh, we work together with our board, but but it can't be uh, just subject to human. <clears throat> God's work cannot be subject to uh, to a human uh, being controlling everything. So. So we uh, were left out on an iceberg again, mainly me, and, uh, and I can say honestly that, that being on an iceberg by yourself, it, though it's a lonely experience, is not a bad experience. Um, it, it certainly gives you uh, more visibility. <laughs> Many ministries are looking for visibility and pay a lot of money to print magazines and to print articles and everything, but, but, but when you're on an iceberg by yourself, everybody's watching you, and if God honors you, if God uh, vindicates the work that you're doing as coming from God, it's a very good thing to be on an iceberg by yourself. And so I've been on it twice before, and I guess I'm on, a, on the iceberg now for the third time. Uh, I certainly do not want to dishonor God, and none of us do. Uh, we want to only, we want to only uh, do what he tells us to, and and um, and follow his instructions. 
And so I believe, my wife and I both uh, feel certain that the message presented, though it's somewhat, somewhat uh, not, we're not able to accurately understand the future uh, accurately because we don't know exactly uh, how things are going to happen, but we understand that the basic message presented to wake up and to study and to be aware that we're at the end of time with, with very uh, short time left before our cases are to be uh, closed, uh, be it the Sunday law. Uh, I recently have uh, been informed from a friend of mine that the Sunday law may not come as a tsunami. Uh, the, the Sunday law is already in place. Uh, the U.S. government has already discussed it. The U.S. president has discussed it. United Nations have discussed it. Uh, it's not called a Sunday law. It's called the, the law of the environment. But it's already been it's already been uh, discussed in in both houses, uh, Senate and the Congress, and the U.S. Go uh, president and uh, the United Nations. And basically, they have they have uh, uh, agreed, including the U.S. And when they talk about, uh, Pastor Mark Finley mentioned the Paris Accords. No, the U.S. is still part of the Paris Accords, even though the president talked against it. He's, we're still part of it. Uh, all, of the, all of the nations have agreed that this is something that they're going to support. And the question is, uh, how, what is it going to look like? We don't know yet. We have to watch. We have to be ready. Uh, I have been informed that it could come uh, as a rapid buildup, not as a sudden storm, but as a rapid acceleration uh, of an awareness and enforcement of, of a Sunday uh, observance, all under the name of the environment. And so we don't know. But what we do know is we cannot sleep right now. Sleeping right now is, is, uh, is fatal. Anybody who sleeps spiritually inside of God's people now will wake up to find out that they're not prepared. There's a preparation process, and that's the part, that's the central part of the message. Uh, the fact that the majority uh, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, many people say nothing has changed. Everything is the same. I'm sorry. Uh, a lot has changed. The last three years has brought a very, very large amount of changes in the church, and, uh, and the majority of Seventh-day Adventist members and pastors uh, no longer believe what we used to believe. Uh, and, and so there is only a small minority inside the church that still believe fully in the spirit of prophecy, the inspiration of the spirit of prophecy, and in the imminent coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, for 150 years, the wording was fine. We didn't have to, we didn't have to change uh, what we believed, but now we're making changes. And even though we say it's, it means the same thing, it doesn't. It doesn't mean, it, it's just my opinion, it doesn't mean the same thing, and all we have to do now is remove one more sentence, and then we can we can do away completely with the spirit of prophecy. We're getting closer and closer to being able to do that, and uh, I think a lot of people would be comfortable in getting rid of the spirit of prophecy out of our basic beliefs, so we be, so we can become generic generic uh, Christians, uh, not not having unique uh, beliefs as Seventh Day Adventists uh, in this area. And so there are some changes that have to be made little by little. You can't make them all of a sudden, but if you just chip away at it very soon with a few more changes, you can now fall into line with a uh, communical movement and become part of the general Christian crowd, which is where some people went, would like to take us. Uh, but I, don't ha I have not lost faith in a church at all. This is God's church. This is God's remnant church. Um, this is the Advent message is the message that that must ring across the earth, the three angels' messages. Uh, everything uh, still stands, but the majority have changed sides. The majority have lost their confidence and belief, and so therefore, as we know, the majority is not going to be ready when the crisis hits. So uh, we have, we have a, an issue here where, where it's important for us to... Um, it's important us to realize that we are facing um, we uh, we are facing a great crisis very soon, and to, to face a great crisis and stand faithful during the crisis does require a preparation. It requires the Holy Spirit to do a lot a, a great work in our lives, and it 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 requires um, 
It requires us to put away worldliness, to put away habits that we've had for years. Even my 83-year-old father, uh, uh, he's, a, he's a retired pastor, uh, very well, very well uh, educated in systematic theology, and he's very careful in everything he does with his studies. And, uh, and he, uh, he supports me in the mission, but he studies everything that I say before he gives me an opinion. And he said, let me take this to the Lord in prayer. And he called me the other day and he said, the Lord has convicted me that, that what you have presented is, is correct. And he said, it's making a big difference in my life because many, many little things that I've had habits for a long time that I've, that I've never dealt with, I'm now dealing with. God is helping me to correct what we have in the refrigerator, uh, to correct things. Um, uh, involving his personal life and other things. And so uh, there is a preparation price, a process, a doing away, of, uh, a doing away with things that belong to the world, total surrender to God, um, a confession of sins, all the sins that we've had in our life, and, and preparing for the great uh, crisis and the ceiling that will come afterward. And uh, I certainly want to be part of, part of that uh, preparation process by giving my will totally to the Lord, allowing Him to convict me and to clean up my life, and um, and also I want to be part of the loud cry uh, when and receive the Holy Spirit when it's poured out. Uh, uh, we we believe we believe that uh, even though we cannot see uh, exactly how the future will play out, we th th there's enough information in the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy that we should, as Adventists, understand uh, what is about to happen and recognize it when it happens. Uh, there are no time prophecies which can forecast dates. Even though most of Ellen G. White's comments regarding time prophecies were regarding the setting of a date for Jesus' second coming. October 22, wasn't it? There's now another date. And there's no more prophecies. There's no more tests. Time will no longer be a test for God's people as it was in 1844, a setting of a date for Jesus' coming. It will no longer be a test. But in context, we're talking primarily about setting dates for Jesus' coming, not recognizing events. Uh, one of the things my wife and I have trouble, uh, have trouble understanding is when, 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 when Rome comes to North America and with the Pope uh, standing in Congress and the Senate meeting with the president, speaking from the White House, and having, having a law dealing with, with uh, a day of the family to be set aside, which obviously will be Sunday, and having it already internationally accepted, and now bringing it to the United States. As I mentioned in one of my videos, some of our, some of our missionaries went to Washington when the Pope came, and they, they were there, handing out great controversies. They had an op approved, approved uh, location, and they had a poster uh, showing the, 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 the Church of God with the, the woman dressed in white with uh, standing on the moon with 12 stars around her head. And, uh, and the, the Catholic priest came over and, and started talking to them. They thought it was Mary, but they realized it was, it was not discussing Mary at all. It was discussing the people of uh, God's last day people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And so they, they discussed uh, a lot of things. And finally, they said, we're here in Washington. We're the advance guard uh, from the Vatican to discuss uh, the environmental laws and to prepare Congress and to prepare uh, the Senate for the Pope's arrival and the discussion of these laws. So, uh, one of our members asked them, uh, since, you're, since you're here to discuss and you're experts on the, on the environmental laws, I've read the encyclical, Lauda Si, and apparently it's talking about the environment, but it's not really about the environment. It's really about a day of worship that will be eventually enforced. And, the, and, and the, uh, one of the priests said, you're a very smart young man. I was very astute of you. That's exactly what it's about. So from the very mouth 
of these Catholic priests specializing in the, in the uh, environmental law, uh, they themselves admit that it's about a day of worship, that eventually will be, will be uh, it's wrapped up in the environment, but it's really about a day of worship, which we know is Sunday. And so um, with, with all the information we have, my wife and I are greatly amazed that so few Adventists and so few leaders and so few uh, publications actually discuss it. When we as Adventists, this is what we've been waiting on uh, for 150 years, a sign that, that, that something is about to happen, and it's when North America stretches forth its hand across the Gulf and clasps the hands of Romanism and, and with spiritualism, <coughs> excuse me, with spiritualism uh, combined, which, which, which is what we have, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, the different, the different uh, spiritualistic meditations coming in to the different churches and spiritual formation creeping into the churches. Uh, this is the sign that, that should have immediately, all the warning flags, and we hardly heard anything. Only, this, only the, uh, the Sabbath school lesson a few months ago mentioned that the Pope's visit to the States was a very important prophetic event. But in 2015, we got silence pretty well. We got silence. And, and so once such a major event happens, we can, we can, of course, uh, we can, of course, realize that if we recognize it for what it is, a fulfillment of prophecy, then we can understand what is coming next. A series of events are coming, uh, which will result uh, in the, the Sunday law, the enforcement, and increasing pressure. Uh, it has to be associated with some kind of disasters as well, economic, economic uh, uh, pressures. Uh, it has to be. It cannot be enforced by itself. It has to be through the. It has to be through the pressure of the United States. Uh, usually, uh, uh, Christians to ask and to accept uh, a requ to request the government to enforce it. So there has to be a great work to be done, and there has to be some quite a bit of pain involved. So we can usually, we can usually, um, uh, or we should be able to recognize that before the Sunday law can be enforced, there there will be some severe, extreme. Uh, painful events that will happen uh, before that can happen. In fact, I don't know if some of you know or not, but this last week with, uh, with the very severe dips in the stock market uh, across, across the board, very, very extreme uh, uh, dips or, or falling of the stock market, there has been a lot of discussion among fi finance people that uh, and even the president uh, and uh, people in the stock market and the Federal Reserve discussing when would be appropriate to change the U.S. dollar to come in with an alternate currency. Of course, if that happens, the alternate currency would be would be based on on would be legitimate currency as compared to the the false value of the U.S. dollar today, which is just uh, which is his paper, and so th this would bring about severe economic crisis in the U.S. and other countries that deal with the U.S. dollar, and uh, and it would bring much suffering and much loss. If something like that were to happen in the near future, then uh, Americans would generally tend to agree that we need to turn to God and and ask Him to solve the problem. So from the spirit of prophecy and research and others, we can tell that there is going to be some severe painful times coming, and that will lead into the Sunday law. So uh, we should not be surprised when, when we have it. I would, I would expect that in the next few months, there will be some very painful things happening, maybe early next year, maybe late this year. We don't have too much year left this year, but it would not surprise me that, that God would allow his, us to see these things developing. Now, uh, regarding Doug Batchelor's 
comments, uh, he really didn't uh, he really didn't um, write something himself so much as he did uh, stand stand with uh, with Scott Ritzema, who wrote an article on it. Uh, the problem with Scott's article, uh, it's very very nicely done. The problem with Scott, he and I have been in contact together with Scott and I. Um, the, the problem is that Doug, Pastor Doug, uh, a few years back, um, confirmed his belief that Daniel 12 uh, could definitely be literal, and that is talking about the future and the context is future. Sister White also supports that idea when she says that we must study Daniel. Uh, uh, and we must understand it uh, for those of us that, uh, that for the for the end time, uh, talking about the future, not the end time, 1798, not the past. But and she also rebuked. She also rebuked another presenter who had been saying that the 1335 days were already fat past, and she rebuked it as an error. And and so Pastor Doug also uh, refers. To, there's a video. There's a video about Pastor Doug uh, also uh, uh, on the internet on YouTube, which he describes that. Now, at this point, he did not back that up. So some people have wondered, uh, have you changed your position? Is he still, or is he just, is he just being careful? Uh, in either case, whether he changed his position or did not I don't think he did. I believe he still believes that Daniel 12 could be literal, but he's not necessarily wanting to take a stand on that right now. Uh, he doesn't need uh, increased stress. And uh, he's, needing, he's needing to keep on with his ministry. God has called him and given him a beautiful ministry with amazing facts, and I'm very grateful for what he is doing. And I'm sure uh, Brother Scott as well is doing a beautiful work. But there's room for us to grow. There's room to understand. There's much that we need to learn and much, much we need to unlearn. So it's very clear that w the, de the deeper we dig, and the more we study and the more we listen to as other people present their findings, we need to be open and flexible. I am absolutely convinced that the, the last generation is going to understand that the process of events very clearly. Right now we see it a little bit nebulously, but I believe uh, the last generation will understand uh, clearly uh, what is happening, and that means that means we must understand the events. We must understand the timing. Uh, it is my conviction. Uh, it is my conviction after studying that uh, there are periods of time, such as Daniel 12, literal time in the future, and uh, we know there is literal time. The thousand years is literal, and uh, it is in the future. And there is many other. There's several other examples that would also help us to understand that I also believe that that there's multiple fulfillments, multiple fulfillments uh, for some of these prophecies in the past and historical method, a literal uh, time as w in the future. Uh, some of them have three. Many of them have three fulfillments with pagan Rome, with uh, papal Rome, and the future Rome. And so, and so I, I have been in contact with several pastors, and uh, it's, I've been surprised at what they have studied. Uh, one of the pastors has just recently finished his graduate work at Andrews, and he defended his thesis, uh, presented his papers, and got an A, the, the highest grade, uh, from his theology professors. And uh, it's on this particular subject, and he said, David, Many accuse you of setting time. It's not setting time. Recognizing parallels, recognizing, like 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, that all the things that happened in the past are an example to us uh, upon whom the latter days have come. So Paul is also saying that everything that happened in the past, we are to look at and we can consider an example to us upon whom we're li uh, those of us that are living in the latter days. So, so, uh, uh, I have come to the conclusion that we need to study. I need to study. There's more there. There's more information. And if we are going to live in those days, God is going to show us 
uh, exactly what is happening so we can understand that God is in charge. It might look like the enemy is in charge, but when you understand the timing and you understand that on a very day things begin and on a very day they will end, it's encouraging to know that God is in control, even though apparently the enemy is in control, not when you understand the timing. And and I'm I'm excited. I want to learn more. So I've invited I've invited uh, Pastor Art Brenner uh, and Pastor Lynn Bryson. I've invited them to come to our to our Ecuador meetings. They will be presenting their findings. Uh, this is December 12, December 12 to December 15. Obviously, they will preach in English and then we'll translate it to Spanish. But uh, uh, those that many of you, uh, it's called Battles of Faith. Uh, in Spanish, Batallas de Fe. And uh, and we, you can watch it live if you want. Uh, our Red Adveneer, uh, I probably ought to type in here on YouTube and Facebook. I'll just type it here, uh, the name of our Spanish network, uh, Red Adveneer TV or television. Uh, you can type it in in, um, uh, in YouTube and Facebook, and you can watch live. It's coming up on the 12th. We will be presenting that, and uh, uh, you will see, oh, oh, by the way, we're not just interested in presenting one point of view, we want to study both sides. So I've written to everybody uh, who has uh, previously expressed uh, opposition to some of the points, asking them to make recordings that we can present live as well. We want to see both sides of the picture. So far, only Pastor, only Pastor Stephen Bohr has responded saying that he has time to do it. Doug, Pastor Doug Batchelor said he, he's in a campaign. He doesn't have time. Uh, Brother, Brother Scott said, I'll think about it, but he hasn't been able to respond on that yet. Uh, another pastor said he, he didn't want to do it. And so we might only have one, uh, one pastor who can, uh, who can uh, send us his positions. So I appreciate I appreciate him taking the time to do that. And uh, we will present both sides so that everybody can see uh, uh, both sides, lay all the cards, lay all the cards on the table, and, and then we can pray and study and ask the Lord to uh, lead us there. Uh, now, regarding, regarding Pastor Mark Finley, uh, Pastor Mark Finley and I have been friends for many years. Uh, it used to be when he was the director speaker of, of It Is Written, he used to always give me a hug and say, David, you're a man after my own heart. That, that's what it used to be and until he became a vice president of the General Conference. And then slowly but surely that attitude, that attitude started changing. Uh, it became more a denominational position more than an evangelist position. But we all change. So everybody has the right to, to have a... A, a change in, 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 in views, but um, there was a time when Pastor, Pastor Findley and I were preaching together, and um, I was asked by the organizer of those meetings to please present um, a, a project to open up a television a station just on health. We, I was speaking, we were speaking to a group of dentists and physicians, here in the States. And I was asked to present uh, a television network. It was my, it was my idea to have a, a health network uh, run by dentists and physicians that could carry the health message. And uh, I presented it, but uh, Pastor Mark was not happy. Uh, he, he came to see me and he'd walk with me for two hours and he tried to convince me that we should not do that. Unfortunately, I had already presented it and uh, the physicians and dentists were so happy that in 10 minutes, they raised $510,000, half a million dollars was raised to be able to start this network. Well, Mark was a little, Pastor Mark was a little upset at me and he told me the next day, he said, David, why are you doing this? Why are you putting up television ne networks around the world? And I said, I said, Mark, um, Jesus is coming very soon. We have to work while it's daytime. Night cometh when no man can work. 
And, and then he turned to me and he said, David, Jesus is not coming back as soon as you think. And I was quite shocked to hear him say that to me. But I said, well, it's my conviction that he's coming back sooner than we think. So I guess maybe we just have to have different opinions on this. And I think this explains to a great extent the, the sermon that Pastor Mark uh, presented recently. Last week I was on the Amazon River in Brazil. We stopped, along the, we stopped along the river just to listen to the sermon while we still had a telephone signal before we left too far from the city. I heard it. I felt he did a very good job, a very Christian, kind way of presenting it. I appreciated that. Um, he is a kind Christian individual. Pastor Mark is a, is, a, is a kind Christian individual, and I appreciated the way that he presented it. But, but again, uh, it, the, what you present is, is, is affected by your belief about how soon Jesus is coming. If Jesus is not going to be coming for a very long time, uh, then, then keeping things calm, not getting all stirred up, not not getting, um, I don't want to use the word panicky because none, none of us, I think, true children of God are panicky. We're happy Jesus is coming soon. I'm not panicked by the idea of a Sunday law. I'm happy that we're going to be seeing Jesus come very soon. But but if you do not believe that Jesus coming is that soon, then you, you certainly will not believe that there's a Sunday law around the corner or in the pipeline, as Pastor Ted Wilson said. And you certainly will not want to preach messages about the urgency of the times. So uh, I've, I've shared with you what Pastor Mark Finley told me some years ago, and I believe, I believe that probably he hasn't changed his mind on that, that probably uh, he believes that we still have a long time. Now, by long time, you understand that it could be 50 years, it could be 100 years, but uh, in relation to our immediate future, it's, it's a long time. And if you believe that, then his sermon, uh, his, his presentation makes sense. Uh, if you believe that Jesus' coming is imminent, and it's going to happen very soon in the near future, at least the last final events leading up to it, then you, you're going to have a sense of urgency to wake up, to get ready, to allow the Holy Spirit to change us, because Jesus is coming. So I believe... Um, uh, that even though Pastor Mark is a very kind Christian individual, his, his point of view on Jesus' coming affects his, his presentation just as much as my belief that it's imminent, that Jesus is coming in the very near future. Uh, and that affects the way that I work. It affects my sense of urgency, how I work uh, around the world, how I'm always traveling all the time. I wish I didn't have to travel. I'm very tired of traveling. Uh, the older I get, the more I like to sleep in my own bed. Um, I do that twice a month. I sleep in my own bed about twice a month. And, um, and yet, God has given me a sense of urgency where I'm putting up television stations and orphanages and schools and medical boats and airplanes, radio and television, everywhere, all over the place, because I believe that we won't be able to do that very soon. And every time, I just finished putting a, a television network, we bought one uh, in, in, in Suriname, which is next door to Guyana on the north coast of South America. Uh, we're broadcasting digit, digital, di digitally uh, in English, uh, Dutch, and uh, we have a, a music channel just for moments of peace. And then uh, working together with the conference office, the mission office there, the mission president and director of communication, uh, working together with them, we we they 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 are going to be running a channel which is called which is a Taki Taki channel. Taki Taki is a is the national dialect, kind of a Dutch Portuguese English type of dialect that they speak in Suriname. But I'm delighted to think that all the people in the capital city can now hear about Jesus coming. Uh, and get ready for Jesus coming. Every time we put up a new TV station, I have I mean I am thrilled to death that the message of Jesus coming can now go into every home. The president's home, the congressmen, the senators, uh, police, the judges, the lawyers, the the professors, uh, the average church member. 
they all have a chance equally to be able to be exposed to the news of Jesus coming. So, uh, again, I want to say, I don't know exactly what's going to happen next year. I don't know how, what form it's going to take. I can say that I don't even know exactly when. I can only say that God has impressed me that the, the parallel of Rome attacking Jerusalem in 66 and then destroying in 70 is similar and can be considered a, a, um, a type of what's about to happen. And, and again, we can only recognize it as we get close. But as I listen to the sermons of Pastor Brenner and Pastor Bryson and read their materials, I have to admit that they, their studies have encouraged me a lot. There's more, there's more to be studied. Incredibly enthusiastic, marvelous information is hidden in Daniel and Revelation. And the wise will understand. Uh, page 77 of Christian Service says, those who place themselves under the control of God, to be led and guided by him, will capture the steady tread of events as he ordains them to take place. In other words, those who are under the control of God will understand the events as they happen. I have to trust that God mean, means what he says. And I have to believe that he will tell us, he will show us, he will help us to understand. So I'm, I'm convinced that Daniel and Revelation is filled with more material than we can think of. In fact, I was only looking at three and a half years. Starting in 2015, September, until early uh, spring of 2019. But if we understand Daniel 12 correctly as being uh, the main primary application as being to the future, all of a sudden we realize there's another three and a half year period that will start with the Sunday law. So there's really a total of seven and God always works in seven, three and a half years to prepare before the Sunday law and three and a half years to, for the loud cry after the Sunday law. It's beautiful. I wasn't, I wasn't even thinking about that, but as I've seen the new material, I've be, I'm becoming more excited as I go. God is revealing to his people that are awake and studying. Uh, and I, I want to be part of that group. I've had three pastors call me. And they, they called me to thank me that they have presented my video in church. And they have discussed it. Some agree, some don't agree. That's not the point. But they all agree on one thing. It is time to be awake and studying. We cannot sleep at this time. And I praise God that is exactly the purpose that what God has wanted. That is the purpose why I made the video. That is the purpose why God impressed me to make the video is that the, that the church will wake up and, um, and study. And so this, this meeting we're having today is also um, similar. Uh, I, I have to admit, uh, I, I don't, I normally would not, uh, I would normally would not place this, what I'm going to say right now, in uh, what I talked about, Pastor Finley, I would not say that uh, to try to broadcast it around the world, but, but I just, since you asked me, uh, one of the questions was, how would I react to Pastor Mark Finley's film uh, recording? It's in context of what I understand, what Mark, Pastor Mark Finley told me that he does not believe the coming of Jesus is that imminent or that near in the future. It's, it's going to be longer than, than, than I believe. So I believe his response needs to be placed in light of his understanding. Uh, just two weeks ago, a friend of mine asked Pastor Ted Wilson the same question uh, and, uh, at, the, at the annual council, at the fall council. Ask him, do you believe in Jesus' imminent coming? And Pastor, the pastor Ted Wilson said, yes, we believe in him and coming, but, but, but we prefer to use the word soon. And so that my friend asked him, well, how soon is soon? When could Jesus come? And Pastor Ted Wilson also said, it could be in a few years or it could be in a hundred years. So, so I, I cannot in any way judge Pastor Ted Wilson. He's a godly man. He loves the Lord as well, but we have to, we have to understand that Pastor Ted Wilson believes that Jesus' coming could also be in a hundred years from his from what he told my friend. So uh, 
I, uh, I believe that many of our leaders and our pastors, uh, some of which are godly and some are not. Some are worldly. Some have very other ideas and some don't even believe in the spirit of prophecy or sometimes the Bible. That, that's for God to judge. God has to, has to search every heart and God has to uh, make a decision. We, we cannot do that and we're not called upon to judge our brethren. But we will know them by their fruits. Pastor Mark Finley is a very godly man. Pastor Ted Wilson is also a very godly man. But, but if you believe that Jesus could come in a hundred years, I believe that there's no sense of urgency uh, that will drive you. I believe that you just will see, try to keep things calm until someday a Sunday law comes and someday it is very clear. Uh, I do not believe Jesus will come in a hundred years. I believe the events, the final count countdown has already started. And of course, I have liberty of conscience to believe that. I should have freedom of conscience to believe that, as well as I want to, God wants us to give Pastor Finley and Pastor Ted Wilson freedom of conscience. We have to allow each other freedom to believe, and even if we believe differently on different things, we should respect each other, and we should allow God to guide each of us in the path that God is opening for us. I just had a meeting yesterday with my brother, who's not an Adventist. He left the church years ago. Um, he studied theology in the Adventist church and the university, but some of his teachers left the Adventist church and are pastoring Sunday churches. I think this had a big influence on him to doubt what we teach. And uh, his br a brother-in-law, as also a physician like he is, and, uh, and he also has, has started going to a Sunday keeping church, and he doesn't believe in the Ten Commandments and under the New Covenant. And we had a long talk with my father and me, my father and I on one side, my brother and his brother-in-law on the other side, and, and they're both thinkers, they're both honest, and they want to study. But I believe what, that once you, once you believe something, it affects your whole life. My father and I believe firmly that Jesus' coming is imminent, it's at the doors, and that the final countdown has started, and it is time to put away sin, it is time to be dressed in a white robe of righteousness, it is time to ask forgiveness of every sin that God can bring to our mind, and to ask him to purify us and make us white, and to dress us in his white robe of righteousness, his righteousness by faith, Jesus' life. And so, because we believe that, we do not want to criticize other people who do not believe it. But, but we must preach, we must live, we must act in accordance with what we believe. And, and uh, that is why we put out the video, and that is why we, uh, and that is why we uh, have come to the conclusion that this is what God wants, and God has given us great peace. We are happy. We are not discouraged. We are, we are, we, we feel God's, God's pleasure with what we did. That was the right thing to do. It is not perfect. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's n no sermon is perfect. No presentation can perfectly uh, state what God wants to state, but, but it was everything I could give. And I did the best I could. And, and I believe God is doing the rest. He's, he's interpreting it and, and bringing different results to different people's minds. Uh, certainly, it should not be something that makes us upset. Uh, to be upset that Jesus might come soon means that uh, we're in love with the world and we don't want Jesus to interrupt our plans. I, I'm very happy, and many people are very happy. They're packing their bags, they said, to go to heaven. Well, uh, one of the questions that people ask, what happens if nothing happens next year? That that has always been a question that people have to ask. When God impresses me to say something, what happens if it doesn't happen? Well, we would have to be fearful. We would have to act in fear. And I believe that, I believe that fear does not come from God. If, if I do what God wants me to do, he will take care of what happens. Uh, if people get ready and nothing happens, God will have to talk to his people. And if, if, if something does happen, which I believe it is, in fact, I'm more convinced now that that, that timing is correct I just don't know how it's going to look like. Uh, I, can't, I can't say that yet, but I'm, I be, I'm more convinced. Uh, 
I, I almost lost my life a few a few um, weeks ago in my our airplane. This is my first accident that I've had uh, in my life to destroy an airplane uh, with me as pilot. I was involved as a passenger one time, but as a pilot, this is my my first time in an accident like this, and it was certainly designed to be fatal. There was gasoline everywhere. I could have died, and yet not a scratch, a little tiny scratch, a little bit of blood, about one drop is all we got. The other co-pilot didn't get anything, uh, and uh, and we re immediately knew God had sent his angel. There was gasoline in little puddles all around the airplane. Any fire, it would have been a, f a bomb. It would have exploded and would have incinerated the pilot and co-pilot. But God preserved our lives, and I'm so glad that I can be here today. Uh, I uh, received a phone call from another friend of mine who recently ex has almost experienced like uh, what um, you might have heard. I'm trying to remember uh, the name, the previous, the previous uh, director of, of It Is Written. Uh, the young man. I'm trying to remember his name right now. It just uh, slipped me. But uh, maybe some of you can write it down there uh, if if you remember what his name is. But uh, yeah, Brunstra, Sean Brunstra. Thank you. Uh, Sean was preaching in uh, Rome. I've preached in Rome, and he preached for six. He was preaching for six weeks, and suddenly he became he became extremely ill, almost to the point of death. And he had to be flown back, and he. And he spent a lot of time in Eden Valley where they discovered he had been poisoned. Uh, and uh, this is a frequent occurrence when many of God's people um, are preaching the truth. The first two Adventist pastors that, that were teaching in Spain, they were invited to the house of the priest. And both of those Adventist pastors, missionaries, uh, died of poisoning the next day. Uh, the priest had poisoned them. They invite you to supper. I've been invited several times to visit with the priests in Georgetown, Guyana. Uh, they, they asked me to come to the Jesuit Center and to meet with them, and I refused to go in there. I refused to share a meal. I refused to, I said, if you want to talk, we can talk in the street. Uh, we can talk under the airplane wing, but I will never, I will never uh, be willing to go inside of a building and meet with, with uh, the Jesuits there inside their building or to have any kind of uh, meal together absolutely not and this one friend of mine uh, went to Brazil recently and um, was almost poisoned on several occasions God made it very clear they, they were not to eat uh, food except by prepared except from one person that they could trust and and other friends of mine that have experienced near poisonings too uh, I, I believe I believe uh, the devil is very angry with this message and uh, we'll try, not only tried, but we'll try again. And, and I, might, I must stay close to God and spend some time in prayer, very close, and let God direct me where to go, what to do, where, what to eat, where to eat. And, and messengers that are preaching a message like this uh, are very frustrating to the enemy, uh, to Satan, to any of his agents. And uh, they have planned to surprise God's people, like Christian service says that those who Satan knows that if God's people will sleep a little longer, he will be sure of them, and their destruction would be certain. Uh, I don't remember the page number, but it's it's uh, early in the book Christian service, and uh, I think it's a condition of God's people in that chapter. And and we. Must, we know that if we sleep a little longer, our destruction is certain. It means something's going to close. A door is going to close. Sleeping a little longer will ensure our destruction. We must not sleep. And so with God's great peace and joy in my heart, I, I want to tell you that um, all of the opposition, all of the uh, negative comments, there's many more positive comments, 90% positive, 10% negative, uh, are only designed by God to spread the message even more. And so every time there is uh, a sermon or a presentation or an attack on the message, all it does is make it more visible. Um, one theologian wrote to me, uh, 
and he said, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to ensure that you are destroyed. And I said, but that's the wrong spirit. Uh, I said, you've been a friend for a long time. If you want to give your opinion and state that you don't agree, it's perfectly okay among Christian brethren to disagree. But to try to destroy somebody is of the wrong spirit. And he said, Satan is controlling your mind. Satan is not controlling my mind. Satan tempts us, but God is controlling my mind. And, and he said, no, Satan is controlling your mind because you have, you have, uh, you have accepted uh, the fact that, that uh, is rejected historicism. I said, I have not rejected the historical point of view. I just believe there's multiple fulfillments and God is God. He's already... There's several I could list, examples of that. And he said, well, I, I'm going to make sure that, that your credibility is destroyed. Um, he's calmed down now. Uh, I think, I think uh, he got quite a bit of criticism for what he was doing. And I, I thank the Lord that somehow he's calmed down and he's behaving more normal now. <laughs> and, he's, and he's behaving more like a Christian. So maybe God is teaching. I told him, I don't want to, I don't want to drink from the same cup that you're going to drink from. Because if you treat other Christians like that, God's going to let you taste the same thing. And I think, I think he's calming down. And I'm so glad because I, I hate to lose friends over something like this. But we must give each other freedom to, to see things differently. And we must all submit our surrender, our wills, as we present uh, what we see. And let God, let God um, lead us closer and closer till there is one fold and one shepherd. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And I want to allow everybody else to... Uh, also be led and God himself will lead us and we'll all be standing together when Jesus comes. So I know we have a few minutes here, not very much, but if there's a few questions, I'm uh, open to questions. You can write them down here and maybe maybe we can answer them or not, but I hope it's been an encouragement to you and don't be afraid to stand by yourself. Don't be afraid to, to be on a nice spirit by yourself. If God vindicates the message and vindicates you and what he's asking you to do, Actually, it's a blessing because all of a sudden, everybody's watching and the blessing is multiplied. So thank you very much. Hi, Sister Anne. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. It's so nice, Agreed. the spirit you have towards the people who are speaking against you. I love that. I think we all need to learn that. Um, you know, I have a question. You know, in Norway, I don't know how it is in America, but this is very, very rare that we hear anything about a three anxious message. And sometimes I wonder if uh, somehow the pastors have got some kind of, uh, you know, that they cannot speak about that because we are into the ecumenical movement, or how are your thoughts on that? Um, I, believe, I believe that most of the church believes that the second coming is still not imminent. It's, it's still some time away yet, that we have some time. And most of the ecumenicals, of course, not all. We live in a very Baptist environment here. And a lot of the Baptist preachers are preaching, Jesus is coming, get ready, get ready, get ready. There are more Adventists than our, many of our pastors are mm. uh, in that respect. And so I believe that if you do not accept the imminent coming of Jesus as being at the doors, I think that uh, almost all other beliefs will be pushed into the future. For example, uh, if Jesus is not coming for 100 years, then we better line up with our brethren and get along with them and, and agree with them because uh, we have no hope for the future of Jesus coming to rescue us. But if you believe Jesus is coming in the very near future, then all of these events are part of the last final events. It changes your perspective. So if you do not believe in the imminent coming of Jesus, then it's, it's easier to explain why many of our pastors do not want to preach the three angels' messages, why they don't want to preach an, unp an unpopular message. You have to believe Jesus is coming in order to be able to preach the three angels' messages. Hmm. Yeah, and you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, the more inquiry comes from the Lord, I mean, we can hasten Christ's coming back. If you think that he's coming in 100 years, you know, we get... Uh, peace and safety and it's no, no danger. So, you know, when Mark Finley is saying, you know, he might come in two years, he can come in 50 years, you know, somehow, I mean, we can hasten the Christ coming, right? 
Uh, that's what Spirit of Prophecy tells us. I believe Jesus has wanted to come uh, a long time ago. We know that 1888, Sister White told Elder Crozier that Jesus would have come in two years if we would have accepted the message of righteousness by faith. No internet, no television, no radio, but Jesus could have finished the work in two years. And, and, and so therefore, therefore uh, our attitude, if we wake up and get ready, but the, the problem that Jesus has is that the 6,000 years is running out. I believe God has only allocated, God the Father has only allocated 6,000 years total. And like it or not, it has to finish in 6,000 years. Now, none of us know the exact year. We don't know uh, if it's, like some people think, 2031. Some people think 2027. Uh, some think it's less. Nobody, none of us were there when the earth, when, when, when Adam and Eve sinned. So we're not really sure what year, but we're very, very close. In this generation, the 6,000 years will run out. And that's all the time God has. Satan knows his time is short because he was there at creation. He knows, how, he knows when a 6,000 years runs out. Jesus would have wanted to come earlier, but because God's people keep delaying and the bride is not ready, out of love, Jesus keeps postponing. But he can't postpone any longer. There comes a time when Jesus has to finish the work. And so therefore, we have a part to play. If we get ready, we wake up and we consecrate ourselves and the, and, and the message goes across the world, get ready, get ready, Jesus is coming, then Jesus can finish his work mm. and come and put an end to the sin and pain. Mm. So in that respect, uh, in that respect, uh, yes, we can, we can uh, even though we haven't, we could have made it happen sooner. But we as a people have not. So now we're at the end of time. Now we're out of time. There's no choice. This time Jesus is coming. Mm. Amen. Well, it seems, you know, that there's, uh, the, the two groups in church get more and more. One group get more and more sanctified to Satan that way. And the other group, you know, they want trumps and, you know, they can do everything. So, that, you know, those who are sitting on the fence, somehow they have to start to think, you know, something is wrong, you know. Right? But uh, we, uh, last day event says we, there will be both separation and unity at the same time in the church. The two groups will be separating further and further apart, and those that are getting ready are drawing closer and closer together, and those that are going into the world, they're also going closer together. Um, and, and, um, but... I believe, I believe God's people that are concerned and awake will, will draw closer and closer together. And we need to learn to be tolerant. For example, uh, I believe Pastor Finley is a very godly man and he's given his life to spreading the gospel. But I also believe that God is trying to teach us more than what Pastor Finley is going. So if Pastor Finley is not open to considering it, I think God will bring other people. And eventually he will have to study it and God will tell him what what he wants him to do, and he'll have to accept or reject. But I accept him as a full brother in Christ with a different opinion. And, and I, with the mission that God has given me is different than what God has given him and given you and each of us. And so uh, uh, there's a couple questions. Do you want me to address some of the questions sure. that are also sure. coming on the screen? Sure, please. Okay. Uh, uh, the seven-year period, three and a half and three and a half, they're asking if, it's, if it was created by the Jesuits. Well. The, the three and a half year period that the entire Bible is filled with that from the book of Esther to, to the, the ministry of Jesus, uh, the ministry of the disciples. Um, uh, there, there are multiple periods. Um, the video I need to, I need to, before I leave, I will post pastor Doug Batchelor's link there. Uh, so people can copy it, um, on his video, but, but he also points out multiple times when, when three and a half years is found throughout the Bible, and, and the God loves working in three and a half year periods, the, the destruction of, of Jerusalem also with a three and a half year period, uh, so many things. And so I believe what the Jesuits have done is tried to redirect it in an opposite direction. They cannot deny the three and a half year periods, but they try to steer it away so it doesn't point to Rome, uh, to, to fight Protestantism and to, to, to fight the accusation that, that Rome is the beast. But 
but uh, the Bible is filled with three and a half from the moment Jesus began his ministry to his death from his death until stoning of Stephen and uh, in many places including Daniel and Revelation so we're going to see it again it is biblical we just have to allow God to show us in context of how it's how it fits these last days we can't there are no time periods that you can predict the date but once the last events begin happening then we can understand that God himself has chosen the dates for example someday God will personally announce the day and the hour of his coming when God announces the day and the hour he's giving a date it is future and it is literal so th there will be dates uh, in the future but we don't know what they are until we see God acting once we see God acting then 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 a plan is laid out and now we can understand let me go to the next one here some people are buying houses to live in the country do you think that time is right uh, well we should have been living in a country for a long time uh, we should not be living in the cities uh, we should have been living in a country already uh, and uh, working working in the cities we can still work in the cities as long as before the Sunday law comes once the Sunday law begins to be enforced and God's judgments are about to fall on the cities the Sunday law will be our sign that we can no longer work in the cities but right now we can work and we should work to save the people in the cities but we should not live in the cities if there ever was a time to live outside the last moments of earth's history it is now uh, definitely uh, we're almost the time is almost finished we should have at least started three and a half years ago when Rome first came to attack Jerusalem in 66 the Christians left immediately well when the Pope came in 2015 that was the sign that we should all have be living outside the cities for sure and right now we're almost out of time but if God still allows you to sell your home or to move we should definitely move let's see what what is this uh, oh if what if you continue living in a city uh, like like uh, Samson those who continue living in the cities can be saved but they will die with the wicked uh, if you continue to live in the cities when God has told us not to and and we insist and there's so many people living in the cities uh, God can still save you if you if you are God's children disobedient like Absalom I'm sorry like Solomon ah uh, sorry I'm like like uh, Samson uh, God can forgive you he forgave Samson but Samson still died he suffered the consequences of his disobedience and so we must live outside and work inside until a Sunday law comes and then we can't even work inside anymore um, do you have any resources we can go to show how to start an Adventist radio station in the US uh, that the FCC in the US the Federal Communications Commission uh, accepts applications uh, you need to go on the internet and talk to people I would go to a local radio station and um, or talk to people who are already are 3ABN also has has support for those who start radio stations in the states and they will give you advice you, uh, churches can apply for radio station licenses you can get community low power stations um, TV and radio and uh, and so uh, there are guides uh, that will help you online FCC or a local TV or radio station or um, or, or other 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 Adventist stations um, there there is there are several Adventist radio stations like 3ABN radio and uh, and others I forget all the names there's probably about 10 different uh, Adventist radio networks that you can go to for help and they will help you do it. but the FCC can help you also if you can contact the FCC or look on the web page um, let me let me see if you give me a second I will find this I will find this um, link uh, from Doug Batchelor uh, and uh, I think I think it will help also with a literal understanding of literal uh, the literal uh, fulfillment of Daniel 12 it's a, just a short clip uh, but it will help uh, let's see here I'm going back I will find it here shortly I'm just looking through a previous uh, here we go okay I will copy this link uh, let me uh, let me copy it now I'll come back here 
Okay. Now uh, let me let me just paste it here. Okay. Uh, that'll be a very interesting interesting link for you. That will help you to understand the literal uh, fulfillment historic as a past application, a future a literal. Uh, it's very uh, I couldn't do it better than he did there. In fact, in fact, um, uh, I've been learning a lot from him and and other presenters as well. Okay, do we have any more questions, or should we? I have another Bible study coming up shortly, so in a, in a, a short less than a, about half an hour, or so I need to get ready as well. Um, maybe we should just. It's late for some of you. It's after nine o'clock there, so um, I want to I want to uh, ask God's blessing on you. If we can close with a with prayer, uh, and uh, and then we'll. I have to run along and get ready. Uh, we have somebody typing, but I'll look at it here in a minute. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so, so much for giving us this opportunity to be together. Especially we pray for our leaders. We pray for our pastors, our church members. Some are in rebellion against you and against each other and against the world church. Others are simply sleeping while others are, are honest. They love you. They want to know the truth and they are looking for truth, present truth. And we ask you to please lead, to wake up those that are sleeping. Please lead those that are looking for truth. Lead all of us into truth. And you are the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And we just ask you to please guide us and lead us because we all we want to know exactly what is happening as you open the way, as we want to understand what you are doing. And we want to understand prophecy in Daniel and Revelation. And it takes study. It takes prayer. We have to meet together. We have to open your word. We have to see what the spirit of prophecy says. And we have to look at what others are saying and preaching and teaching so that we can learn and then you will guide us into all truth. Thank you for this Bible study group being based with, it, with Sister Eva out of Norway. And Lord, we just ask for a special Sabbath blessing on each of us. We want to be with you and we want your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and minds. Fill us with your joy like, uh, like you promised you would with your peace in, in John uh, 1427. We love you and we thank you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.